Hello, I'm Jan McKay Rosinski, Director of the Drug Enforcement Administration Museum. I'd like to thank everyone who has joined us for this special Red Ribbon Week program. We're pleased to present this new documentary about Enrique Kiki Camarena, in whose honor and memory Red Ribbon Week was created over 30 years ago. Please allow me to introduce Josh Edmondson, our Curator of Education. For this program, Josh has recorded many new interviews. He has also pulled clips from previously recorded oral histories. Please be sure to follow us on social media, join our mailing list, and visit our newly remodeled museum in Arlington, Virginia. And now, Curator of Education, Josh. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Jan. Putting this program together has been a great honor for me. I have been hearing the stories of Kiki's life and legacy since the day I started working at DEA. Every year, Red Ribbon Week is a special time for all of us here at DEA, as well as for millions of people around the country who celebrate and promote living healthy, drug-free lives. I am thrilled that we have been able to add this program to the public record of his life. I would like to thank Richard, Rick, Hindman, and the rest of the staff in our audiovisual department for working with us to produce this documentary. Kiki's mother, Mrs. Dora Camarena Soto, inspired this project. Back in March, Dora sent a letter to the DEA. She talked about Kiki's sacrifice and fondly remembered being a part of the DEA family and participating in many Red Ribbon Week programs over the years. Further, she gave thanks for the work of the DEA and asked that we never forget Kiki. She was 96 and in hospice care at the time. The letter was her farewell and touched many of us deeply. A couple of months ago, we started planning this year's Red Ribbon Week, and we started talking about possibly producing a new documentary about Kiki. I knew that there were already a number of documentaries, articles, and even movies and TV shows about Kiki, and was not sure about how to proceed. Then Jan asked me if we had ever done an oral history with Dora. The answer was no. That conversation was the genesis of this special project. At first, we all thought it would be impossible with Dora in hospice care. Then I spoke to her daughter, Myrna Camarena. Myrna immediately told me enthusiastically that her mother would love for us to visit her. She said that although Dora was infirm, she loved having visitors and would be happy to tell us some of her memories of Kiki and her experiences with Red Ribbon Week. As I reached out to Kiki's friends, colleagues, and family, I decided to use this opportunity to record Dora's stories and to also try to learn more about the man behind the legend. In the end, we were able to hear not only from Dora, but from his widow, Mika Camarena, son, the Honorable Kiki Camarena Jr., and sisters, Myrna and Diana Lucero. Further, we reviewed and pulled clips from older oral histories from one of his closest friends and colleagues, Pedro Pete Hernandez and James Jaime Kukendal, who was the resident agent in charge in Guadalajara while Kiki was there for this project. We will also hear from Kiki's classmate, Henry Lozano, who helped found Red Ribbon Week in Kiki's honor, and a couple of educators who participate in Red Ribbon Week as well. They are Principal Sean Thomas and Monica Santos of Imperial Beach Charter School. Monica is also a niece of Kiki's, as we shall see. She had some special memories to share with us of her uncle, as so many of our other interviewees did. The opportunity to meet and interview Kiki's mom was a very special experience. She had been living in hospice care for many months. The day of our interview, she came out dressed in red with a big smile on her face, accompanied by her daughters, Myrna and Diana. It was a beautiful sunny afternoon, and we were on a terrace overlooking a lovely garden. She was animated and happy to talk about her son and their family. Sadly, in the weeks after our visit, Dora's health quickly declined. 
She passed away peacefully, surrounded by family and friends, on the evening of August 30. At this time, we will take a moment to remember a courageous woman who participated in turning the tragedy of Kiki's loss into a call to action in the movement that is Red Ribbon Week. She traveled all over the country and internationally, speaking to students about the dangers of drug misuse. Further, on behalf of my colleagues at the DEA Museum, we would like to dedicate this program to her memory. Enrique Kiki Camarena Salazar was born on July 26, 1947, in Mexicali, Mexico. His parents were Dora and Daniel Camarena. Kiki had eight brothers and sisters. The family immigrated to Calexico, California when Kiki was about nine years old. Daniel and Dora divorced, and Dora raised her children in Calexico, California. Several family members and friends have told us about many happy memories of a small and tight-knit community in Calexico, where everyone knew everyone, and kids often played out in their yards and in the streets until late at night without a care in the world. Here is what Mika, Myrna, Diana, and Henry had to say when I asked them about what it was like to grow up in Calexico. Growing up in Calexico, uh, we didn't have very much, but we didn't know any better, so we were just happy kids. You know, we played with whatever we, f we would find. We didn't have all the extra that other families did, and we didn't miss them. We felt safe in Calexico. Calexico at that time was uh, 12,000 in population, and everybody knew each other. And you talked to the neighbors, and if somebody was getting married, everybody was invited, even if you didn't know the person getting married, because there wasn't much to do. So. It was uh, a little town, and it, it's grown so much right now, but back then, all, we all went to the same high school. We all knew each other's parents, sisters, cousins. So it was a little town, a sleepy little town. It was a safe place to be. We could be with the kids in the neighborhood, our neighbors, and we, would, we could be sitting out on the curb till midnight, and that wouldn't be a problem, just playing our games. And it was also very hot, so we would love to get wet and um, go to the high school swimming pool and swim there during the day and then hang out during the night into the wee hours of the morning if we wanted to and nothing, there was no concern by our parents. As a young boy going through elementary, junior high, and high school in Calexico, um, it was happy days. <laughs> Kiki was one of nine kids. I asked his sisters what it was like growing up with so many siblings. Here's what Myrna and Diana told me. It was active, it was joyful, and we really didn't need any friends because we were so many. And uh, what was your blouse was my blouse was your blouse handed down, and it was just wonderful. It, I have a lot of nice childhood memories. Well, for me, see, I'm the baby of the family of nine siblings, so I can honestly say that it was just um, me being a baby all the time and they took care of me. What can I say? I have heard time and again that Kiki was an incredibly dedicated and driven special agent. I wanted to find out what he was like growing up. I asked Dora, Mika, Myrna, Diana, and Henry about the memories of Kiki from those days. When I was a young boy, I was muy travieso. Chiqui, esto, lo otro. Mamá, déjeme a mí solo. No, we were friends and we were, um, we were both very shy. So a uh, hello was the, <laughs> was the extreme of it. <laughs> um, and we didn't start dating until we were juniors. When I graduated from high school, he gave me a really special gift. He actually took me to select it. And it was, there was this one jewelry store in Calexico, it's called, it was called Siglitz Jewelry Store. And he took me and he had me pick out my favorite, one a pendant of, of some sort. And I picked it out, it was a Scorpio sign. That's my, my, my uh, sign, signal, sign, I guess. And he had me pick it out and he paid for it and that was his gift for me. 
And I thought that was really, really special, that he actually made a special effort. He and I alone went to the jewelry store and we picked out my pendant. Gigi, to me, was my role model. He's the one that told me, drop college, join DEA, and go back to school and get your, your degree, but you'll have the DEA job. I wow. followed his advice, and here I am, 35 years later, with DEA and retired, and a college graduate. So that was amazing, and I'm glad I followed. And that's why I say he was my role model. And he also told me, he belonged to the Lions Club in Calexico, and he told me, why didn't you put him for the scholarship? And I said, no, I'm not gonna get it. He says, do it. I did, I got it, and I remember him escorting me into Holly's Hotel, and I was holding on to him, and I felt so proud that I was getting my $250 scholarship for college, and he was like my dad. He, he walked me in. So that's why Tumiki is a, a role model. My favorite memories is his kindness. You know, that he'd say hi in the morning to you at, at school and recognize you if you're in a classroom and, you know, and, and he did that with everybody. He just, he had a big heart. He had a mission and it was an honor to be in school with him. Back in the days that Kiki was growing up, Calexico was a relatively small town. There was one high school and all the kids went there. We have heard that Kiki was very athletic. I was curious about this part of his life. I was also interested to hear about what kind of a person he was to go to school with. Here's what we found out from Dora, Mika, Myrna, and Henry. Y me dijo, voy a subir alto, 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 mucho, mucho para arriba. He was shy. He, um, he kept to, to his own friends. Uh, he was very likable, but um, he, he selected his friends very wisely. And if he didn't like somebody, he'll, he, he'd, he'd stay in the crowd, but he'd stay about, uh, away from those in particular. He, he's, he was, he considered his friends very special. Well, unfortunately, he was injured in the football game and then he wasn't able to play for his senior year. He was, he took it very personal uh, when they lost. And uh, it was amazing because my, my girlfriends would always ask me at the dances if he, if he was angry. I said, no, he's not angry. He just lost the game, that's all. That's why he looked like he was angry. <laughs> he was very popular because he was a good looking guy. And he was even selected for uh, best all around. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they still have that in high school anymore. But that's when you're um, voted as being the most popular, the most uh, nice going guy. And uh, then he was popular with, like my mom said, in basketball and football. So, but I. Because of the age difference, of course, I wasn't in, this, in school at the same time he was. But I remember him being very popular. And then he had part-time jobs, so he was a very busy man. Kiki was very studious, and I think it had a lot to do with, um, with sports. Uh, he, he trained hard. Um, when he went out on the battlefield and any of the sport endeavors he was engaged in, he was determined. You could see it in his eyes. Same in the classroom, though. He was, you know, uh, he was a very focused individual. He, he would, you know, he, he'd get to the questions that teachers were asking, reply, respond, and if he didn't get it, he'd ask. Uh, very focused in class, and as he was also on the, on the campus grounds. Everyone's stories of Calexico and Kiki's personality and talents have helped paint a picture of Kiki that I had not known before, and I am so glad to have heard from our interviewees. The stories are bringing him to life for me, and I hope for you too. We asked Mika about when she and Kiki first met, what kinds of things they did together in school, and when and where they were married. I met Kiki at uh, Danza Middle School. So we were in middle school when we first knew of each other. And uh, it's not until we um, were in high school that we started dating. 
And so we would go to games, we would go dancing after the game. And uh, pretty much besides that, it was just on weekends. We didn't see each other during the week other than at school. Because he lived on the east side and I lived on the west side, we wound up with uh, uh, different um, teachers for some reason. We got married in Calexo at Our Lady of Guadalupe Church, and that was on March 14, 1970. It was in a small woman's uh, club hall, the reception, and now that I go back to see it, I think, oh my God, it was so tiny, but when I got married, I thought it was huge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> After high school, Kiki joined the United States Marines. After serving for three years, he returned to Calexico where he became a fireman and attended college. Later, he became a police officer and was assigned to El Centro, California, where he worked as a narcotics investigator for Imperial County. He joined the DEA as a special agent in 1974. He was very concerned about the drug problem in the United States and wanted to make a difference by helping the people he cared about. At this point in our program, we have moved into the time of Kiki and Mika's lives when they are parents. Kiki is a special agent, and they have three little boys, Kiki Jr., Daniel, and Eric. I asked Mika to tell us about what it was like having a special agent for a husband and what it was like for their family in Mexico. It was difficult to get used to it. Um, I guess I started getting used to it when he uh, was in the narcotic task force in Imperial Valley, uh, but being with DEA was much more intense. Um, it was getting used to not talking to my family about what Kiki did or didn't do. Um, very private. Uh, I had to be private with my neighbors as well. Um, when we moved to Guadalajara, it was a completely different story because, uh, because Kiki was seven, uh, the, the two little ones were too little to play outside, but uh, Kiki wanted to be outdoors. Uh, and uh, I remember him asking me if he could play baseball. And uh, I said, well, let's, let me talk to your dad about it. And uh, so when Kiki got home, I, I asked him and he said, well, let me check things out first. And there was a, there was a field where the, the boys were playing baseball. And he checked it out and he said, no, we can't. <clears throat> and I didn't ask anymore. I knew, what, I knew what he was telling me. And so it was hard to explain to Kiki that, that he, he couldn't. And so, um, it, it, we were much more cautious of, about our surroundings. Um, I don't think he, he ever relaxed, especially when we were out and about. He was always looking around, he was always looking behind him, and I got into the habit of doing that also, especially if the children were with me. We had an incident once uh, driving from the supermarket and I was with the kids and Kiki had warned me that if anybody tried to stop me in any form or way to, to not panic and just keep driving slowly unless they forced me to stop. And so we, the boys and I had an incident where a car came up right next to us and stayed he was driving slow with me and they were looking at us. And, and so I tried to stay as calm as I could, and then they sped away. And after that, I couldn't get home soon enough and just get my kids to safety. And I told Kiki, and he said, well, you did the right thing. So um, they're just, you know, whether they followed me later to find out where we lived, I, I don't think they even did that. I think they had their own way of finding where we lived. So, um, it, it was it was difficult. We were going to the ice cream parlor, and Kiki was driving in a neighborhood close to ours, and he was driving very slow. So he was he was scouting addresses, 
And I turned around and looked at him and said, not when the kids are with us. And, that, and Danny remembers because he, Danny would not forget anything. And Danny remembers and he says, he asked me, what was dad doing, mom? Oh, nothing. He was just looking at the houses, how nice they are and all. But um, that was Kiki. We asked Mika and Kiki Jr. about their memories of Kiki in those days and what kinds of things Kiki would do with his family during downtimes. Here's what they had to say. I would have to say spend weekends at home. Uh, and we were able to, we would uh, take the oldest, which was Kiki, to the movies. And um, it meant a lot to us for him to learn the, the Spanish language because he was only um, seven when we got there to Guadalajara. And so it took him about a year and a half to pick up the language. And, and uh, so we enjoyed taking him to see the Spanish speaking movies because when we first took him, he couldn't understand anything. And so later on, we, we realized that he had picked it up and he was, he was enjoying the, the movies that, that we would enjoy. Um, other than that, it's making a run to the ice cream parlor, which they had over 31 flavors. And um, he, Kiki's mind was always at work. He did not take the time to rest unless he sat down and literally fell asleep. <laughs> you know, that kind of mind that's always working. And I remember one time that we went to the, to the ice cream parlor, which the kids and I had always gone to before. But this was the first time Dad was with us. So uh, we walked in and of course they, they're looking at all the flavors back and forth, back and forth. And I looked at Kiki and he's standing by the door and I'm saying, take a seat, this is gonna take a while. And so um, sure enough, after going like three or four times back and forth, the two little ones decided they wanted vanilla. <laughs> And we just thought that was hilarious because there were so many flavors. And uh, I said, okay, we're done. So unbelievable, but true. After that, he drove us to a park. And so the kids were just having a ball from one. There weren't too many places that they could play in the park, but they were there. And again, Kiki said, are we ready? And I said, why don't you go ask them if they're ready? Don't ask me, ask them. Of course they were, <laughs> they were not ready. And eventually we went home. But uh, I can say this much, that those two experiences, they'd never forget. They still talk about it. I would do the traditional, uh, fill the eggs with confetti and um, have the kids color them. And basically every Easter it was just us. So we would both get on our knees and let the boys uh, crack the eggs on, on our oh. heads. <laughs> and I have pictures of that. And, and now Kiki does that. I've seen him do it with his boys. <laughs> I know my three brothers and I really love to play with Hot Wheel cars. And there were times that he would get down on the floor and play with us too. Um, and we'd make a mess. I remember him not participating in cleanup. <laughs> colleagues of ours here at DEA recorded oral histories with some of Kiki's colleagues in 2019. These included one of Kiki's best friends, his compadre, Pete Hernandez, who even baptized his son Eric, as well as Jaime Kukendall. We were looking for their thoughts about Kiki as a colleague and friend. Here's what they told us. Kiki was a quiet guy. He was uh, very innovative. He tried new things. Uh, he knew how to handle informants really well. Uh, establish a rapport with, with these people and, and uh, get them to do things that, would have, that were dangerous for them, but they did it and they, because they liked him a lot. He was very honest. Um, not, bo not boisterous or vociferous. He was uh, polite. He was a gentleman. Really good undercover agent. Great friend. Kind of guy you admire all the time. 
who are some of your heroes in drug law enforcement? Well, I guess the main hero would be Kiki Camarena, you know. He and I met each other at the academy. We were in the same class. We, he and I became close. That when we got transferred, I mean, I got to Midland and he got to California because uh, San Diego. And we stayed in touch. The SAC in Mexico City was at Heath at the time and he called me up. Uh, I, he had been the boss when I went down to do the operations down there both times. And then he was in Dallas when I transferred to Dallas, but he left shortly after and went to San Diego. Well, he calls me up and he said he was going to be in Mexico and that he'd like for me to, to go to Mexico. But he also wanted me to uh, get two guys that worked the way I did or, you know, had my style of working and as dedicated and, and as I was and stuff like that. And to give him the names and to get them to apply and he would uh, get, make sure that he would, uh, that they would get transferred to Mexico. So I immediately called, you know, I talked to, thought of Kiki. And because uh, I knew he, he and I really could work together. He says, I'm on. So I make a phone call to Ed Heath. And I said, the name is this. He said, what about the other name? I said, no, I, I don't know anybody else that close that I can vouch for. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that's what I said. You know, I said, you know, I, I know how he and I are going to work if we work together. I said, but I don't know about anybody else. He said, okay. And Kiki applied, and he got selected. And you got to. And he got to Guadalajara. What do you want people to know about Kiki? It's already been said that he was a gentleman, that he was a good guy, that he was, but he was a brother to me. I mean, we spent a lot of time together on and off duty. We spent vacations together, okay, with family. So people didn't know, um, except for a couple, two or three of us, you know, a few people knew his heart and how he felt, how he was, because he was always a gentleman. You know, the stuff in the, in the in narcos, mm -hmm. you know, where he's cussing and, and where the hell is all this stuff. Uh, he never cussed. You know, he didn't, he didn't use the F word and everything. And in the movies, he's always, you know, and he wasn't like that at all. Uh, and I know that when we went to visit a couple of friends of ours, and the, you know, Lupita would come over and this a lady, and she was an older lady. I mean, Kiki would click his heels when he, and bow to her when he introdu was introduced to her, when she came around. I mean, that's what kind of a gentleman he was. The Camarenas had been in Guadalajara for over four years, and Kiki had been successful in infiltrating and disrupting some multi-billion dollar drug growing operations of powerful, wealthy, and violent transnational cartels. On February 7th, 1985, Kiki was kidnapped in broad daylight and never seen alive again. This is the story of his murder, narrated by retired DEA Special Agent Steve Murphy. Like many notably positive things, Red Ribbon Week grew out of something profoundly negative. On February 7th, 1985, Enrique Kiki Camarena Salazar was kidnapped by drug dealers, never to be seen alive again. For his kidnappers, their story ended there. However, for Camarena's family, friends, and the grateful nation he served, it was only the beginning. They pledged not to let his legacy fade nor his sacrifice be in vain. Across the country, citizens wore and displayed red ribbons. I wear my red ribbon every day. Not only in memory of Special Agent Camarena, but also those whose lives were lost trying to free our nation from substance misuse. The red ribbon also symbolized the emergence of an intolerance for drug misuse. In a 1988 proclamation, Congress established Red Ribbon Week to commemorate the work and life of Kiki 
and to reject drugs in schools, workplaces, and our communities. The sensational story of Kiki's kidnapping and murder made headlines around the world, struck fear into the hearts of people around the world, rocked the U.S. government, and in particular, DEA to its core. His death changed DEA forever and was not in vain. Kiki's legacy lives on, and he is looked upon as a man who devoted his life to helping Americans and the DEA mission. A special legacy of Kiki's is Red Ribbon Week. Fellow classmate Henry Lozano had devoted his life to helping people struggling with substance use and misuse. He had founded a nonprofit in El Centro, close to Calexico, that was working in juvenile detention centers and jails when the story of Kiki's death broke. We interviewed him, and here's what he had to say about how the event inspired him. We were doing operations in juvenile hall and the county jails and doing all of that. Next thing you know, we had an operational plant to work from, and it just grew and grew and grew. And, um, and, and in the middle of all of that, all of a sudden, uh, this international story transpires about the death of Kiki Kamadena, a DEA agent. And everybody, uh, if, you, if you would have been in the Imperial Valley and, and been in Calexico like I was, there wasn't a soul there that didn't have a tear in their eye. Everybody that knew the Camarena family and loved them, all of us that were there as family members at that time, husbands with children and wives, um, the impact was profound. It was just, it was a devastation to everybody. And what transpired uh, was there were, let's just say they were, Let's just say they were prominent people in federal agencies flying in from all over to go to the Calexico Catholic Church for the ceremony. And a lot of the young people were wondering what was going on. Why were so many of these people here? And then the parents would tell their children, well, there was this man called Kiki Camarena. He was a Drug Enforcement Administration agent, and he was killed. Mexico. And that was just a little bit more trauma. Well, the family obviously, bless their hearts, were in massive trauma, and that, but held it well. I mean, they, very brave family. And so that's what caused me to go to Calexico High to ask the principal if it, I could talk to the young people because of all of that going on. And he afforded me that opportunity. They were having some kind of rally in the gym anyway. And he said, well, follow me in. And he took me into the gym. They had just closed down the rally. He introduced me, and I very simply shared carefully, uh, n not the details. I didn't share anything other than they already knew that there was an accident. A friend of mine, a classmate, and you know, here in Calexico High, and and I know there's a lot of things going on in town that some of you are concerned about. And so I presented the idea of creating a, a drug-free club, you know, and, uh, and, and I, I asked, with the permission of the principal, if I could invite some of the students that would want to come out and sign the pledge that I had outside. And so they came, and the pledge was, we pledge to be drug-free, and help our friends be drug free and you know our families to be drug free. And about 100 kids, it's in a newspaper article, uh, came out and the Pure Valley Press printed it and uh, it just, you know, it just, it happened. And all of a sudden I realized that I was, you know, a small part of a big thing that had just transpired, but I could, in my own heart felt incredibly blessed that this many young people came out to sign that pledge. And from that group, we formed a drug prevention team of high school students. And they started working with us and community parents and leaders and community organizations and in the cities of the Imperial Valley. It wasn't just Calexico, but that's where it all started, right there with the family, with the story, with you know, all that has gone on with Calexico High. It was 
for me, a miracle that I was there at that time and an honor that, that everybody worked so hard to honor the name of Kiki Camarena. What an incredible story. It is amazing that Henry was there and had already started working in drug misuse prevention when everything with Kiki happened. I asked him what happened next. We realized, I mean, it, it seemed like it just evolved. All of a sudden, we realized that there had to be a symbol. And the red ribbon was the appropriate symbol for his life. Well, that was our thinking, you know. And, uh, and so we started to pass out red ribbons to people, giving them the story. And people would instantly just pin it to their shirt or their, their jacket or something. And next thing you know, red ribbons were going out and the kids were passing out red ribbons and a movement started. And it was so earthy in its creation. There was, it wasn't like there was a, you know, a five-phase plan to do this. And what, like I said, what transpired was Californians for Drug Free Youth, the board of directors that came down to the meeting that I'd planned with the city of El Centro. El Centro means the center. So we had, we had leaders from every city around El Centro that came to that meeting. And Californians for Drug Free Youth invited them to become a, a, a region for in California that would be connected to California's for Drug Free Youth, the organization. And as I've mentioned, they invited me to go on the board of directors. I was honored, went back to be on the board of directors. And that's where I sold them the idea of the Red Ribbon Campaign. I told them, here's what we're doing in Calexico. I think this could be, I think this could happen in the state of California, that we ought to look at, you know, what we could do. Therefore, the, you know, the time in October just happened to be an opportunity time to do something like that. And by this point in time, we'd already approached the governor and California became the first state in the nation to host a statewide Red Ribbon campaign. All the school districts were involved, all the prevention organizations, treatment intervention organizations, everybody was donning Red Ribbons. And it was easy because it, they had nothing on it. You could just go get some ribbon and cut it and pin it on your lapel, you know? So it was just, it was simple, it was creative, but people got a hold of the idea. And it always stayed within that first year, within the realm of understanding, we were honoring Kiki Camarena. This wasn't about some new drug-free club. This was about honoring a man who gave his life, you know? And, and the best way we could do that would be this way, to to pledge to be drug free in memory of Kiki Camarena. And like I said, none of that was planned. It just happened. And it just, you know, graciously, the kids were excited to do that. The adults and community leaders were excited to do that. And it just kept going and going and going. There is a national organization that I was part of on their board. It's called the National Federation of Parents for Drug Free America. And I shared with them about what we were doing in California. Well, California was getting news that was already going out about what was happening in California from the governor's office. And so they invited our board of directors to come to, uh, to, come to Washington, D.C., to their national conference. And we were all there, and they allowed us to show all the video and pictures and put you know, all the pamphlets on the, on the tables of all of those states and people that came there. Next thing you know, there was a movement at the national level. And the National Federation of Parents carried that momentum. They were the ones that then said, for all the organizations and states that are connected to us, we're gonna create a national Red Ribbon campaign that will go out every October. And we'll, we'll help move that. And they, they invited our board to become part of their board so that they could have the wisdom that we had by creating it in California. And it grew and grew, and here we are today. Later that year, club members presented the Camarena Club Proclamation to then First Lady Nancy Reagan, bringing it to national attention. Later that summer, parent groups in California, Illinois, and Virginia began promoting the wearing of red ribbons nationwide during late October. This campaign was formalized in 1988 by the National Family Partnership, with President and Mrs. Reagan serving as honorary chairpersons.
Today, the eight-day celebration is an annual catalyst to show intolerance for drugs in our schools, workplaces, and communities. Each year, between October 23rd and 31st, more than 80 million young people and adults show their commitment to a healthy, drug-free lifestyle by wearing or displaying the red ribbon. Now, here we are celebrating Red Ribbon Week for the 36th year. We were able to visit Imperial Beach Charter School in San Diego, California, where we interviewed the school's principal, Sean Thomas, and Monica Santos, who also happens to be a niece of Kiki and Mika Camarena. We asked them what Red Ribbon Week means to them and their students. Here's what Sean and Monica had to say. Like a spirit week with a positive twist. Kids are bombarded with everything from social media to vaping to all these other negative life impacting choices. And so I feel that Red Ribbon Week is a pathway to give them positive voices. I think first of all, they think it's fun. <laughs> and then second of all, I think for the majority of our families, it echoes what they hear at home. What I remember as a child from what I remember now, it's just it's, it's the same type thing. Um, it's kind of like a spirit week at school where we, we may try to make it fun for the kids and try to bring more awareness to it. Um, whether, you know, crazy hair day on Monday and dress up, say no to drugs Tuesday and they have cute little slogans that they come up with and the kids seem to like that. Um, for me, it's... Uh, I don't know that it's changed. It's always been a little bit more about my Tio Kiki for me, like the week where we just remember him a little bit more, I think. When the teachers decorate their doors and it's, they make it just fun for everybody to, it's just a spirited week. It promotes a healthier lifestyle and um, being this close to the beach, especially this area was known for, um, it was like a biker town and it was, it was known for um, a lot of drugs. And we never came here growing up. We didn't come to the beach here. We'd go a little bit up north because um, it was really bad. So I think it's important for this community, especially. Red Ribbon Week means, um, it means my tío Kiki to me. We also asked our other interviewees to tell us what Red Ribbon Week means to them and about some of their favorite memories from their experiences with Red Ribbon Week over the years. Mika, Dora, Mirna, Kiki Jr. and Henry said, It's very, very uh, fulfilling to be around the, the children. I kind of have my favorites with the elementary because <laughs> I've had my experiences with the older ones. But uh, I really truly enjoy it. Um, I love to see how most of them pay attention and yet there's some that you can see that there's a problem and they'll have their head down and they're not looking at you. And it, it, it just breaks my heart because I know there's a problem at home. Some of them will speak out and say what the problem is, not always, but it's very encouraging to know that, that you're passing a message, that, as I said before, that could save their lives, that, that they're, they're not to be quiet about what they see or what they hear uh, especially in school because um, it creates a problem for all the students, not just them. And so I, I truly, truly en enjoy it. I especially love to be around when DEA is there because they get so excited. <laughs> they love to, to see them in uniform. They love to see the, the drug lab truck, the, the helicopter just takes it off. But the best part is the dog. Yeah. The dog just gets their attention. And, you know, I, my, my message to them is always go home and talk to whoever. I don't say parents, because I, I realize that sometimes both parents are not home. And so I just, whoever you live with, you go and tell them what you learned today and what we talked about. And when you show them your red ribbon, you tell them why we celebrate red ribbon. Because there was a life that was lost and this life that's lost wants to save yours. And that's why we're here. I remember once traveling to Texas and as I was speaking, I reminded them that the drugs are not here two weeks in October only. 
that they're here all year round. They're everywhere. And one of the, the teachers stood up and said, we celebrate Red Ribbon every Wednesday, every, throughout the year. Every Wednesday is Red Ribbon for us. And I thought, whoa, I was so happy. I thought, why can that be done in all the schools one day, but every week? And I realize that it takes a lot of work. I know that the PTA has their hands full, but certainly this has got to be important enough to, to, to guide them to do that. Well, I feel happy because I'm giving some words for the country by the side of my son, who he would have wanted to también hacer lo mismo. It was in Portland, Oregon, and it was during Red Ribbon Week, and I spoke, and this little girl, because I used to especially like to do elementary schools, I focus more on elementary schools than on junior highs or high school. And this little girl, I spoke, and, and uh, it was interesting because when I said Kiki's story, very quiet, because I would start, do you want me to tell you a story about what happened to my brother? And kids love stories. So I would tell them, and they were very quiet. So after I told the story and uh, I said, I like hugs, the kids would come and hug me, and my mom too, because she spoke in Spanish and I spoke in English, especially in Texas. So this little girl came to me, and you know, they're, they're short, and I, I could feel this tug. And I said, who is pulling my dress? And then she looked at me with these big blue eyes and she said, because of what happened to your brother, I will never do drugs. And with that, I said, my mission has been accomplished. If you have touched one child that you've saved, I think that's been completed. I have a lot of experience with Red Ribbon Week. I've been speaking for, geez, I don't know, 20 years now about uh, my dad and Red River Week. And so um, it's just a wonderful, rewarding thing from my point of view to participate and go around to different states, different cities, different schools, and see how varied the participation is, how excited different students and administrators are, um, one, to receive us, and then also to see all the different ways that they um, celebrate Red Ribbon Week. Watching my son, my two boys, their young age in school, to put Don a red ribbon on and understanding what it meant. We asked all our interviewees what messages they had for young people who might be at risk of misusing drugs. Some of the choices may be risky, but hopefully we learn from them. But for students that are so young, it's just not smart. It's just not smart to take a risk and try a drug that could now kill you. Maybe 10 years ago it didn't kill you, but now it does. And we have all the specifics to prove that. All it takes is for the students to believe it. Espero que todos ustedes, los niños de escuela, estén escuchando mis palabras para que ustedes también den un ejemplo para la juventud como está tan adelantada ahorita la droga. No quiero yo que se perjudiquen, que sigan adelante, pero a ver con tanto palabra que yo les demuestramos yo y mi hija que todo salga adelante. What young people need to realize is that we all make decisions and we have to live with our decisions, good or bad. When it's good, you celebrate them. When it's bad, you know, you, you, you got to live with the results. And more likely than not, when you're using and abusing drugs and alcohol, you make bad decisions. And, or decisions that you're going to regret later when you're sober. And so avoiding the abuse of alcohol and drugs avoids bad decisions, avoids regret, 
and it lets you live your life more in a more full way, in a happier way. And I think I don't think there's a person on this earth that would not say no to that. And so let's live a happy, healthy life by avoiding abusing drugs and alcohol. When I think about talking to an audience of young people all the way to adults, they're still engaged at some level or interested in becoming engaged in some sort of drug use or abuse. The story I would say is I died too many times, literally. And if there wouldn't have been someone there to give me mouth to mouth resuscitation and get me to a doctor immediately, I would be dead today. Did that stop me from being an ignorant individual and not do it again? No. Most people don't want to believe that drugs can control your life. It sure can once you become an addict. And you don't have a lot that you want to think about doing that. And you don't want to think about going through withdrawals to stop it. So what's your option? Go find some more. Do it again. That kind of a life? You want to find yourself in a federal penitentiary like I did? In county jails all over the state of California like I did? And I know a lot of young people, if you hear this message, you're saying, yeah, 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 that'll never happen to me. It shouldn't have happened to me. It shouldn't have happened to all the young people that are in treatment centers right now, in halfway houses and in therapeutic communities. It shouldn't have happened to them. It's happening because there were people like me, and if you continue, it'll be people like you that are out supplying those chemicals to people that you know, family, friends, girlfriends, boyfriends, and it will be you. And it will be your fault, just like it was mine. We've got more to do than die. Be on this side of the ball game. Thank you. Drugs are not gonna take you on a good road, and we all know that. I don't need to tell you. You need to make your choice, and you know what that choice is. The choice is say no. Because I have yet to meet a person that will tell me, I use drugs and I'm a pilot. I use drugs and I'm a doctor. No. I've yet to meet that person. If there's a person out there that used drugs and is a real professional and drugs didn't get you down low, low, I would like to meet you. Because drugs are a bad choice and we know that. And for what my brother did, I think, just think about that. He gave his life, make the right choice, and say no. It's easier said than done when you've got all this peer pressure in school, especially as you get older in high school, middle school. The negative voices in your head are monkey thoughts, and if you have peer pressure, choose new friends, and that there's always a natural, healthy way to make yourself feel better. So I believe that there's the prevalence of drugs out there in the in the schools and in the community is there there's so much of it there that it's really hard for kids to stay away especially this peer pressure that they go through and um, you know some will take the temptation and run with it and others will kind of remember and practice and well, they will remember and implement those messages they hear from other, their parents, their uh, older siblings, not to do, go that route or not to do that. So I'm hoping that these young kids will constantly keep those messages in the back of their head when they're presented with an opportunity. The peer pressure to use drugs and to try them out. I hope that they can remember and have the, um, the inner will to say, you know what, I don't want to do that. It's not good for me, I understand it's not good for me, and I'm gonna remember what my mom and dad said, and I'm out of here. That's a, a quick fix. The, there's always uh, deeper issues there. There's a lot healthier ways to make you feel better. And finally, we asked our interviewees how they would like Kiki to be remembered. Here's what Mira, Dora, Kiki Jr., Myrna, and Henry told us. With a smile. Pues le iba a recordar contento, 
porque nosotros andábamos cooperando. I'd like him to be remembered as someone who was willing to sacrifice it all um, for the benefit of others. He sacrificed all so that others could be safer, particularly young kids uh, in trying to take the most drugs off the street that he could and to catch those that were selling drugs. And I think in the end, um, how Red Ribbon Week got started is, is a fitting tribute because it accomplishes that same thing, protecting kids, protecting others. As a hero, my hero, because he gave so much to this country, he gave so much to everybody, he risked his life, and we gotta remember him for that. We can't forget him. And hopefully his memory will continue for many years to come, and he'll always be my hero. I would have loved for you to see him in his sports activities. I would have loved for you to see this champion running that ball one way or another to make a touchdown, to make a hoop, to, to see that smile on his face after it happened, to see all of those team members coming around and hugging that front team that, that made that happen. I would have loved for you to see him in that space. A man's man. Kiki Camarena. Kiki Camarena began his life in a dusty little border town surrounded by a big family and watched over by an adoring and vigilant mother. As he grew up, he became a focused athlete with big dreams. Later, he achieved those dreams and more. He married his high school sweetheart, became a Marine, a firefighter, a law enforcement officer, and finally a DEA special agent. He took his wife and his three little boys with him on his mission to combat the growing problem of drugs in the United States. He worked hard and did good work and sadly became a target of savage, ruthless criminals who ended his life far too early. Kiki's sacrifice was more than any person or family should have to bear. His murder shook our country and the tragedy of it echoes to this day. However, his death was not in vain. Other dedicated agents followed his example and continued his work. A national movement spread across our country in his honor. Red Ribbon Week continues and helps millions of young people every year. While the movement is about more than Kiki, he is behind it, and we honor his sacrifice and his memory every year as we don our red ribbons. Thank you.